So we have learned what an alphabet is. We have learned what a string or a word is. And we have also learned what a language is, right? Let's learn some more operations or some more operators on alphabet strings and languages in this video. So the first concept is called the power of an alphabet, right? So imagine if you're given an alphabet, uh, let's say sigma, right? So what does what does raising to this raising this to a power basically mean? So what if if I write sigma power k, what does this actually mean? Right? So for example, so we'll use this language very often because it is one of the simplest languages. So this is the binary language, right? So we will use the binary language as a simple example, okay, because it's very easy to construct examples using the binary language because it has only two uh, two symbols, zero and one, right? So what does if, if sigma is this, what does sigma power one basically mean? What does sigma power two basically mean? What does sigma power three basically mean? So what do, what do what do these power raising an alphabet to a power actually mean? You can think of this as an operator, right? For numbers, it's very clear. Two power three basically means two into two into two. For numbers, it's very simple. We already know this. But for an alphabet, what does this mean? Right? So sigma power one is nothing but sigma itself, right? So this is the set of symbols that we have as part of the alphabet. This is simple, very, very easy to observe. What does sigma square basically mean? You can write sigma square as sigma sigma. Now, if you think about this, you can think of this as a concatenation operator, right? You can think of it as concatenation operation. So what you what you're trying to construct here is you're trying to construct symbols like this look at this you're trying to construct symbols so sigma square is basically because your sigma is 0 and 1 if i concatenate 0 with 0 i get this if i concatenate 0 with 1 i'll get this if i concatenate 1 with 0 i would get this 1 with 1 i would get this right so sigma square is a set of strings is a set of strings set of strings of length 2 of length equals to 2 and these strings are formed using the symbols in alphabet sigma okay similarly sigma cube if you think about it what does sigma cube imply sigma concatenated three times so the concept of multiplication in numbers right when it comes to alphabets it becomes concatenation so this will be zero 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 all the all the strings of length three that you can create okay so zero zero one zero one zero uh, one double zero one zero one 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 anything else that we're missing here uh, double one zero one two three four five six seven something else is missing here uh zero one zero one zero zero one one zero and one two three four five six seven right there should be eight right two power three possibilities so zero one one is missing here zero one one okay so these are all the eight possibilities that you can have as part of sigma cube similarly what does sigma power k now basically mean so we have seen this right sigma square is a set of strings of length two so sigma power k can be defined as it is a set of all the words or strings. So we'll use the symbol w to represent words or strings, right? So whenever I say w, I mean word or string, right? So we'll use the term word more often than string, okay? So sigma power k is the set of all words w such that, such that the length of w equals to k. And, and of course, and obviously this is clear, w are words okay w are words formed using formed using sigma that's obvious because we are taking sigma power k okay very simple concept of what a power of an alphabet basically means very simple concept right now next learn of a second concept called as clean closure okay we've actually used this already so this we typically write it as sigma star okay sigma star the the actual formal name for it is called as clean closure okay clean i if i if i'm not wrong is the name of a mathematician okay sigma star is nothing is also referred to as clean closure of sigma and what is this to formally define this this is nothing but sigma power zero oh there is one more thing that i missed here what is sigma power zero now look at this we have defined sigma power one sigma power two sigma power three sigma power k all of this what is sigma power zero now what does it imply Sigma power zero is epsilon or epsilon. We already refer to what epsilon is, right? Epsilon is an empty string, right? Epsilon is an empty string. The, again, as, as we discussed in the previous chapter, in the previous videos, when we learned what is the definition of an alphabet string and language, epsilon is a standard symbol that we use for empty strings. Okay. Some books may also use 
this symbol and this symbol also. But epsilon is the most popular symbol. If you refer to any textbook or Wikipedia articles, this is what you'll find. So you can define clean closure of sigma or sigma star as the union of sigma power 0, sigma power 1, sigma power 2, so on and so forth. Right? The union of all of them is your clean closure. Because what is the concept of clean closure? Again, we will stick to this example. Right? If my alphabet is this, right? if this is my alphabet, what is, what is sigma star now? Sigma star is a set of the empty string, strings of length 1, strings of length 2, right? strings of length 2, strings of length 3, so on and so forth. That's, your, that's what is sigma star basically means. So now look at this. Uh, in the previous video, we did not define sigma star using this because we did not define the concept of power of an alphabet. Now, since we know what the power of an alphabet means, we can also define clean closure as this very simple concept. Again, I can also write this as follows. Sigma star is sigma star is the union of sigma power i, right? Where i is greater than or equal to zero, where y i is an integer. Obviously, there is no concept of sigma power 1.5. This is meaningless. Okay, you have sigma power 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. Sigma power 1.5 is a meaningless concept as far as alphabets is concerned. Okay, now with that concept, sigma star is the union of, again, this definition is basically a shorter form of writing the same thing. It's, it's the same concept here. Again, I should have put a union here. Okay, sorry. So I think I think I did a small typo here. So this should be sigma power 0, union sigma power 1, union sigma power 2, so on and so forth. So this you can write it in short form as this, right? There is one more way of writing it again. There are multiple ways of writing the same thing. Sigma star can also be written as, it is a set of all words, W. Again, here, W or W is a word, okay? So let's write this clearly, right? W is a word, it is a word formed using, formed using alphabets, uh, all, all the symbols in alphabet sigma. So sigma star is w such that such that the length of w is greater than or equal to 0. Okay, this is another way of defining a clean closure. Look at this. This is one way of writing it. Here we are using the concept of power of an alphabet. This is a short form of writing it. This is a more simpler set theoretic definition. There are multiple ways to understand the same concept here. Now this is called as clean closure. There is a related concept called as the positive closure. Okay, this is often written as sigma with a plus at the top. Okay, this is again very simple concept, right? Sigma plus is nothing but sigma power 1, union sigma square, union sigma cube, so on and so forth. Remember, the only thing missing here as compared to a clean closure is sigma power 0, which means, which means in the positive closure, if you look at this, so if my sigma equals to 0 and 1, this is my sigma, my sigma, my positive closure of sigma will not have epsilon. It will have 0, it will have 1, it will have 1, 0, it will have 0, 0. It will have 1, 1, it will have uh, 0, 1, it will have all the three strings, etc. It will not contain, this is very important. It will not have, it will not contain, this set will not contain epsilon. Right? That, that's the most important difference between a positive closure and a clean closure. Right? Another way, of course, we could also write this whole definition itself as union over sigma power i, where i is greater than or equal to 1. This is a short form of writing the same thing. There is one more way I can define this also. I can write this as this is equal to set of all words such that the length of this word is greater than or equal to 1 and W is a word formed, right? W is a word formed using, using sigma, using all the symbols in sigma. Again, we don't have to always mention this because this is implicitly understood because I'm, I'm doing uh, sigma plus Right? So this is called as a positive closure. Okay, very simple concept here. Nothing very fancy. Again, most of the concepts in theory of computation are fairly simple. They're actually very simple mathematical concepts. While they're simple to absorb, right? they're super powerful also. As we will learn, mathematically speaking, these are very simple concepts. I think I would argue that theory of computation is one of the easier mathematical subjects to understand what's happening. But still, it is very, very powerful. That's why I, 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 I love theory of computation because it uses simple concepts like sets and graphs and things like that and comes up with the, mo the mathematical model of what a computer is. I mean, that's like magical. Again, we, I, also I also hope that I can convey that magic to you as we progress through the course. 
Okay, so what are the basic properties of these two? Very simple. What is sigma star? Sigma star is nothing but epsilon union sigma plus. That's what it is, right? So the only difference between sigma star and sigma plus or the clean closure and the positive closure is the is the element epsilon. That's all. That's all is the concept here. Now, if, if you perform this, what is the intersection of these two? What is the intersection of these two? The intersection of these two is this because this is a superset, right? Look at this. This is your superset. This is your superset and uh, this is your subset. This is your sigma. B. The only element that is not there, that is not present in uh, the positive closure, but it is in the clean closure is epsilon. That's it. Right. Similarly, if you have to write uh, what is the union of both of them, the union of both of them is also trivial. The union is this. Right. Again, uh, there is one more very interesting property, which is what is the concatenation of sigma star and sigma star? What is the concatenation of both of them? If you look, look at this, this, this is a set of strings. This is a set of strings. If you concatenate both of them, you'll get set of strings and that of that set of strings will be present in sigma star anyway. Right. So this, this is a very interesting property. Similarly, there is one more property which says sigma star, right, with if we concatenate with sigma plus. Okay, so this will be see this this can contain epsilon and all the other ones. This can cup this can contain words whose length is greater than or equal to one. So if I concatenate it, what do I get? Right, I will only get sigma plus because concatenating epsilon will not change the string because this string look at this. This is a concatenation operation, right? So sigma star concatenated by sigma plus is equal to sigma plus. Similarly, this is also equal to sigma plus concatenated by sigma star. Right. Similarly, if you concatenate sigma star twice, you would get sigma star itself because all the strings that you can construct using concatenation are anyway present here. Right. So these are, these are, these are two very nice identities or properties of especially again, these are trivial. These two, uh, let's call this A and B. Right. These two properties are very interesting properties and relationships between sigma star and sigma plus. Okay. Again, here what you have is concatenation. Let's not forget that. Okay. All this is cool. Next, we have learned what a language is, right? In the previous video, right? We learned what a language is. A language L is a subset of the clean closure. This is what we learned. Right? Very simple way to define it. A language is a set of strings and the set of strings that you can have in the language are elements of sigma star given an alphabet. Again, a language needs an alphabet to be defined. Without defining an alphabet, you can't define a language. So let's actually, let me give you some examples of languages so that you can concretely understand what a language is, right? So let's take the alphabet 0, 1. Let's take this alphabet, right? So what is sigma star now? So I could define a language L1, which is equal to sigma star itself, obviously, right? Again, there is a special name to sigma star. This language, which is equal to sigma star, is often referred to as the universal language. This is often referred to as the universal language because all the words that I can construct using Sigma are there in this, right? That's why it's called, think of it like a universal set. Okay. That's, that's one way to correlate these two concepts in a universal set. You have all the, all the possible elements in a set. Similarly, this is called the universal language because every language is a subset of this, right? So if, if you ever encounter this term called universal language, this is what it means. So now let's, let's take some more examples so that you get this concept. Again, I could have L2, which is equal to Sigma plus. This is also a language, right? Because this is a subset of Sigma star. Okay. So positive closure of Sigma is also a language. Okay. This, this is a, this is a second example. There are more examples, obviously. So let's take, uh, let's take more examples, right? For example, imagine if I have language three. Okay. Let's assume I define this language as zero power N such that N is greater than or equal to one. Okay, this is what I'm defining my language as. Again, remember zero is a symbol in my alphabet, right? This is perfectly all right. And this is also a language. What language would it be? Zero, because n has to be greater than or equal to one. What is zero? Any alphabet, so any symbol, suppose what is zero square? Zero square is zero concatenated with zero. What is zero cube? Zero cube is zero concatenated with zero twice. Okay, so this language, look at this. This is the language. And obviously this is a subset of sigma star. And hence, this is also a language. This language consists of, how do you, how do you write this in English? This is a language that consists of, that consists of strings, that consists of strings of one or more zeros, one or more zeros and no ones and no ones. While one is part of my alphabet, 
I'm defining a new language where ones are not allowed. That's perfectly valid. What stops us from doing that? Because mathematically, this is the only condition that a language has to satisfy. So let's let's define one more language. Okay, for example, imagine if I have a language like this, which is 0 power 1, 1 power n, 0 power n, 1 power n, where n is greater than or equal to 1. This is also a language. What does this language say? This language will have strings such that I have equal number of zeros and ones. So 0, 1 is part of this language. 0, 0, 1, 1. This is also part of this language. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. So on and so forth, right? Again, remember that this is a subset of the clean closure. Hence, it's a valid language. Okay, in this language, you have you have n number of zeros where n is greater than or equal to 1 followed by the same number of ones. This is an example of a language, right? Nothing stops us from doing that. Again, you can define any language like this. Again, we'll see why languages like this are important when we study automata or find state machines and push down automata. We'll, we'll learn the importance of these languages and how they're connected to your mathematical models or uh, automata or machines as we progress through the course. Let's understand the basics here, right? So now there are some more concepts called as empty language, finite language and infinite languages. Okay, so if you think about it broadly, if you have language, a language can be empty. Okay, what is an empty language? An empty language has no elements or this is equal to an empty set. Remember, an empty language does not even contain. It does not even contain epsilon. It does not contain the empty string also. Okay, this is very important. So this is what an empty language is. Empty language has no strings, not even the empty string. This is very important, right? Or in other words, you can also, a language is empty if the size of this set is equal to zero. Null set, basically. This is what, uh, this is what uh, an empty, uh, an empty language is. Similarly, I can have finite languages. What is a finite language? If the number of strings, again, very simple. L is a finite language. If this, if the size of this set, remember a language is a set at the end of the day. A language is a subset of the clean closure, right? So a language is also a set. If this is a fi if this is finite, if the if the number of strings that you have in a language are finite, then the language is said to be finite. Similarly, infinite languages. Similarly, infinite languages. If this is not finite, if this is not finite, right? For example, for example, let's look at this, right? Let's look at these examples. This is a not this is not a finite language. This is an infinite language. Right? This is an infinite language because there are infinitely many strings here. Right? Similarly, this is also an infinite language. Well, on the other hand, I can define a finite language like this. I can define a finite language like, okay, set of all strings W such that length of W is less than or equal to 2. Okay, and again, W is strings formed using sigma. Okay, imagine my sigma here equals to, uh, my sigma is uh, set 0, 1. Then what will this language be? In this case, what will this language be? All strings. So epsilon will be in this language, right? Because the string can have a length of zero. String can have a length of one. String can have lengths of, so zero, one, one, zero, one, one. So this language here now, this language is a finite language. This language is a finite language because what is the size of this language? The size of this language is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? The length is eight, which means this language is a finite language. Right? So this is what a finite or an infinite language is. Remember that an empty language, this is very important. Empty language does not even contain the empty string. That, that's, that's the important aspect here. Right? So I, I think I think you got these are some of the core definitions. Again, as and when we encounter new terms, I'll keep defining them with the flow. Right? So I've defined a bunch of operations and concepts here. But if there is something, anything missing here, as we progress through the course, if there is some new term or some new concept, I'll introduce you with the flow.